people, generally speaking, don't really like to speak out because if you criticize the government publicly, um, I certainly know of journalists that have been attacked uh, in London. There was somebody just uh, convicted for his second attack on a journalist. Um, Spe there, specifically uh, reporting on uh, Eritrea? Yes, the journalists were reporting on Eritrea. One was the one journalist was Eritrean and one was British. Um, wow. And uh, you can be, there's all sorts of, you know, um, online kind of hate that can come for you. I've seen a lot of threats sent to people, threats against them, threats against their families. Um, if you travel back to Eritrea, you can be arrested. If you have property in Eritrea, it can be seized. If you have relatives in Eritrea, they can face retribution. Um, so if you have left Eritrea without permission and you want to go back um, to visit family for any reason, for example, you have to sign a sheet of paper in the embassy saying that you have committed a crime and will submit to whatever punishment the state deems fit. Hmm. Okay. That seems like a very double-edged sword. What is a... What is day to day life like in Eritrea? I mean, I'm sure it depends on based on where you're at. I mean, there's the prison aspect, um, again, either overt or covert. But for those who have not touched or engaged in that prison system, what is life like for day to day in Eritrea? I think for the majority of the population, it's a struggle. Um, you know, it's like I said, a very poor country. I interviewed one um, teenager who had spent nearly two years. Um, mostly hiding in his family's uh, one room uh, home to try to avoid forced conscription. Um, but there are some, especially in the capital, um, especially the children of higher ranking officials that enjoy privileges. Um, some of them are diaspora that maybe have sent, been sent back by their parents if they got into trouble abroad. Um, I think those people do have quite a lot of access to um, the internet and knowledge about what goes on abroad. Um, but that's certainly not the experience of the majority of the population. Yeah. The forced conscription, it sounds like, or it seems like you may not know what is going to be done with you, meaning the jobs that you will be forced to do seem very diverse. Um, do you have an idea or understanding of the types of things that they are at? Well, I was going to say asked, but I don't know if that's the right word for it, are conscripted to do? So the vast majority do go into the military. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, that's referred to as SAWA. There's a training camp. Um, they're separated, you know, boys, boys, girls separated into different um, units. There's a big prison there as well. If you try to escape from SAWA, beatings, again, are quite common. Food is terrible. Um, you're not sure when you might see your family again. But um, the, the majority of people do go into the prisons. Some people don't. Um, if you don't go into the prisons, you would need to be, you would need to get good grades. You might be able to um, study as an engineer or something like this. But then you still have to give your service to the state. Has there been, in the 30 years that the president has been in power, has there even been a legitimate, I don't want to use the word threat, but challenge to his position? Or has he held a steadfast grip of control over the country ever since he was put into power? So there was a group of ministers um, who urged pro-democracy reforms in an open letter. Um, that was, I think that was about slightly more than 20 years ago. They're known as the G15. So they signed a letter saying it would be good to have you know, elections, the constitution, the rule of law, all of them were put in prison and none of them have been heard from since. Um, there was rumors of a coup in, in, attempt in 2013. Um, I have heard of other rumors, but it's very difficult to confirm information there because, you know, e even the diplomats who are stationed there often can't really tell you what's going on because they themselves have got so many restrictions. Um, and I think there's certainly widespread um, disenchantment with the leadership of Isaias. Um, I believe there are several people within the government that feel that way, but whether they are going to take any action on that, 
I'm not sure. There's certainly a rapidly growing protest movement outside of the country. And that's why we're seeing a lot of violent clashes at Eritrean cultural festivals, because you see protesters against the government showing up to um, confront supporters of the government. And that's why we've seen, you know, running battles in, in Israel, in Oslo, in um, Montreal, in, um, in Australia recently. You know, you have seen in the last couple of years lots of street fights between this growing, more militant opposition who who really want to challenge the president and um, people who don't speak out against the government, um, people who are content to, or who just who are just afraid to speak out against the government. It might not be that they support them, but it might also be fear. They do have some support. Yeah. Um, I have a stat in front of me here. It says, in a recent global report from the United Nations Refugee Agency, or UNHCR, Eritrea ranked among the top 10 countries of origin for refugees worldwide. Um, why is it, or why do you think that most people today don't know about the refugee and humanitarian crisis happening there? Um, it doesn't present an existential threat to Western nations. Um and there are other crises that do, so we pay more attention to it. It's a small country. Um, a very large proportion of people want to leave it. Um, but by nature, um, many of the people who do leave it are extremely secretive because they are afraid. Um, it's, it's very much a culture of secrecy and not speaking out because the wrong word can always get you or your family put into prison. So many people just don't talk about what they've been through. Many people are deeply traumatized as well. After my article came out, um, I had outreach from a couple of, one was a doctor, one was a psychiatrist who worked with torture victims in Eritrea. And they said, oh yeah, like we really recognized a lot of the things that you described. We've been working with people who have been so traumatized. It's taken them years to, to open up about what happened to them. Um, the gentleman in, in Los Angeles, uh, Wooly, the, the nurse, um, said he thinks that most of the people that have escaped have got PTSD, but they don't have the vocabulary to describe it or the knowledge on how to deal with it. I would agree with you on the lack of an existential threat, so therefore people don't pay uh, direct attention to that. And, you know, the one, I think the hardest question other than human beings are being abused, the hardest question to answer, I think, for people would be, well, why should I care? And I'm curious what your answer to that is. Say somebody in the United States living in California, living their best life, cruising up and down Santa Monica Boulevard. And I have no idea why I just chose Santa Monica Boulevard. It's not something I have a lot of experience with. Why should they care? So... First of all, let me just say, sometimes we all need afternoons cruising up and down Santa Monica Boulevard. <laughs> um, but, we, you know, we also need to be aware of what's going on in our world um, and what's happening to our brothers and sisters around it. Um, we, I think, if we ignore the suffering of these people and we allow them to come out in their tens of thousands and their hundreds of thousands and drown in the Mediterranean and have their kidneys cut out be on camera and a video sent to their brother to try and squeeze another $20,000 out of them and videos of like going of young girls being tortured that people have sent to me you know um, if we ignore that are we are we really human doesn't our empathy make us human? You remember in, um, I think it was Blade Runner, when the test or the difference between a human and a robot was being able to walk by a tortoise on its back and a human would stop and turn it over because it would feel sorry for the tortoise. Isn't our ability to, to feel the pain of other people part of our humanity? 